guess that's my cue. Good to be with you this morning. Wow, what a great time before the throne of grace as a church body. What a great way to segue into the message this morning. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather your body, the body of Christ, and it is our prayer that Christ be magnified, that we come back to the heart of worship and recognize that it's all about you. And we're challenged today with what reorienting worship looks like as we desire to live a life pleasing to you individually, but in community. And so toward that end and for your glory, we pray. So speak through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're continuing our series in the book of 1 Corinthians. And I don't know about you, but it has been an amazing series, uh, preaching through some of the most challenging passages in Scripture. We're looking at chapter 14, verses 26 through 40. And I was, when I was thinking about difficult passages, I was thinking about my favorite football player, uh, long retired from the Pittsburgh Steelers, Troy Polamalu. Amen, Dave? And uh, Troy Polamalu was one of these, uh, he was a defensive uh, safety and uh, was an amazing player. And in the height of his career, I remember he was being interviewed and he was asked, what is it that you like most about football? And Troy said, I love the struggle. And that's always stuck with me. I love the struggle. Not I love sacking quarterbacks, which he did. Uh, I love you know, putting running backs for a loss, which he did. I love intercepting, I love running for touchdowns, which he did. No, he said, I love the struggle. And that has stuck with me. And when I think of difficult passages of scripture, the question I have is, do we love the struggle? And it takes my mind back to another time and place, and I was newly married to Jennifer, my wife, and uh, we were living in Northern California at the time, and there was this mountain creek called Clear Creek up in the mountains, which we had, I had tubed before, and so I decided, well, let's take my family, let's go. So Jen and my parents and my younger sister and I went, and we decided to tube, to tube Clear Creek, which is a great place to tube because it's a combination of kind of idyllic, calm waters, deep waters, as well as some rapids, and some falls, you know, like three to four feet. And so it makes life interesting. Now this is before helmets and seat belts, so it was a little bit more complicated than these days. But, um, so anyway, to make a long story short, we had entered this one stage in the river where there was, uh, where the current took you to about a four foot drop. Now the key was to try to do it smoothly so that you could kind of land safely on the other side. Even if you tipped over, at least you got through it. And so I managed to get through it and um, Jen wasn't so lu lucky. Uh, Jen just, I, I think I remember this right, just before entering that drop, she flipped and then s proceeded to go over the falls just herself and then managed to get her leg trapped as the current was rushing. So her leg was lodged in between some rocks. She's hanging on for dear life uh, on this four foot drop and there were st still people to come, namely my mother. Now, like any good mother-in-law, she just kind of continued on and went right over Jen. <laughs> now, in her defense, she did apologize profusely while laughing hysterically. <laughs> so that didn't really help Jen's case as she yelled, no mom, no, and my mom just goes right over the top of her. Meanwhile, where am I? Well, I'm kind of lodged between these rocks. There's this eddy that's swirling about. I can't do anything. I feel like a toddler with water wings, and I'm holding on, and I'm trying to get to my wife. Now, in moments of crisis, some people's life passes before their eyes. My wife passed before my eyes, and it wasn't in a good way. So I'm thinking, my goodness, we've just gotten married. I've taken her to this place, 
and uh, what's going to happen. Well, she's here today, so I don't even remember how it all happened, but ultimately she was able to get herself loose. As I recall, the current took her underwater, pushed her against this rock, but she did manage, manage to emerge. I was completely useless, so, uh, so much for the protective husband. Why do I tell you this story? Hopefully I remember. <laughs> I tell you this story because we are faced at various points with passages of scripture that frankly at times we'd rather we're not in there. The question is what are we gonna do with that when we're faced with scripture that rubs up against culture, rubs up against what we know to be true, and challenges us. Are we going to, like my wife, get hung up and stuck, and like so many people, either walk away from the faith or pick and choose what we're going to believe? Or are we gonna do the opposite, and that's like me who gets caught in this eddy and does no good arguing about things that are inconsequential in the end. And I bring these because these are tendencies that we have in our culture, and I've seen many people walk away from the faith when they've been faced with scripture that they're unable to reconcile with their own gut. And then there's others of us who have been caught up in these theological, minuscule debates that are inconsequential, meanwhile the world is going to hell. And I think what Paul means when he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians 3.16, is he's saying what we need to do is we need to be students of the word, not simply to be able to cognitively understand and parse every complexity within the word of God because we will never ultimately be able to do that. But if we allow the word of God to read us rather than we simply read the word of God, because remember the word of God is the word of the spirit of God, and if we have the spirit of God dwelling within us, then there's not gonna be a contradiction there. And so are we a house, are we a home for the word of God to dwell so that we bring all of scripture to bear and allow the Holy Spirit then to take the word of God, dwell in us richly, and as a community of faith, we individually build up the corporate body of Christ so that Christ is magnified. That's what we need to arrive at today because today, this passage of scripture, quite frankly, I'm not going to be able to give you the uh, ultimate definitive conclusion on every little detail about it. And there's some uh, things that I know some of you are like, well, I'm really interested in knowing what he has to say about that. I'm not gonna, get dwell, I'm not gonna dwell on the eddies, but we'll address them a little bit more in the podcast. But I want us to look at this passage of scripture and see what is Paul wanting to say to the church in 21st century Cambridge today. Because what, he, what we have here is we have a snapshot of Paul responding to issues that were unique to the Corinthian church. Okay, but that doesn't make them irrelevant for the church in Cambridge. Rather, there are principles at play that we can then imbibe and put into practice today. And it was really cool because this passage of scripture, it takes a lot of wrestling. It's a bit of a struggle for me, still is. But what's cool is, as I begin to really wrestle and struggle with that, the Spirit of God brings out principles that I hadn't seen there before. So join me as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 26 through 40. Paul begins, what then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or interpretation, let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there only be two, or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. 
For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. For if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but, in all, but all things should be done decently and in order. Paul is using a literary device that was quite common in the ancient world known as chiasmos or chiasma. And a chiasma or a chiasmos is a kind of a mirror repetition where it's kind of, if you were to look at the letters, it'd be something like A, B, C, C, B, A. In other words, it's a principle that's spoken, echoed, and concluded with. So, for instance, uh, John F. Kennedy says, let us negotiate. Let us never negotiate out of, out of fear, but never let us fear to negotiate. Frederick Douglass famously said, if black men have no rights in the eyes of the white men, of course, the whites can have none in the eyes of the blacks. Similarly, similarly Paul is using a device here where he's stating principles in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end, and then he's using examples similar to the Corinthian church to illustrate how we can contribute to those principles. So, for instance, if we were to kind of summarize what he's getting at, we would look at the latter part of verse 26. Let all things be done for building up. And then verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And then verse 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. So there's kind of a mirror repetition going on here, and then he brings out some issues that are unique to the Corinthian church. Some of them were somewhat privy to, and some of them were not privy to. And so we can't have any hard and fast conclusions, but we can bring to bear is the fact that Paul, in other parts, says things that if we conclude wrongly here, would be contradictory, and the scripture does not contradict itself. I'll unpack that a little bit later. I know some of you have these confused looks on your face. I get it. I get it. So, first of all, in a, in a general sense, Paul is addressing what it means to be the church gathered as opposed to simply going to church. And what we have here is kind of cool. We have here a little bit of a window into the first century church in Corinth. When you come together, we got a hymn, we got a lesson, we have a revelation, we have a tongue, we have an interpretation. Okay, so what Paul is not doing, he's not offering a template for us to follow, but rather he's addressing specific challenges to the Corinthian church that they were facing, which was drawing people away from worship and was becoming self-serving. That was the bottom line, and, and Kirk touched upon that last week, where the issue of tongues and prophecy um, was a core part of the church, but he was also d discussing ways in which it was being used in self-serving ways. And here he kind of gets to the nitty-gritty of what it looks like when we assemble as a church body. And what came to mind for me is that we need to unlearn some habits of thought related to going to church and begin wondering what it means to be the church assembled. We're not consumers, but participants and contributors. That's why we call it a service. Okay, so... We have the common idea that we go to church, and what we mean by that is a particular building and a particular name of an organization, and we go there, and it's kind of like we go to the store on Tuesday, we go to the mall on Saturday, we go to church on Sunday, and what it can easily turn into is this kind of consumeristic mentality. In other words, it's another goods or service that we're consuming. And I realize that if asked, we would say, well, no, that's not it at all, and I understand that. But the problem is, is this idea of going to church instead of being the church assembled 
gives us a wrong notion in which we come to be served rather than to serve. And the fact of the matter is, I'm not talking about being on a volunteer team here at church. What I'm talking about is, if we are the church, if we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, then every time we come to church, we are to be engaged in serving. We're to be part of the service. And when I talk about the service, I'm not talking about what happens in the auditorium. I'm talking about what happens when we come together as a community, because that's really what Paul is talking about. When we assemble, this is what it should look like, and this is what it shouldn't look like. And the fact of the matter is, some of you, and I know many people have been impacted directly by what happens in the parking lot. Our curbside hosts, Mark Herman, Ken Anderson, Andrea, and Gaia, and some of the others, they're sometimes the first point of contact. And sometimes people's fears are such that they don't want to enter the church building. And the greatest act of service for them that morning is the type of welcome that's uh, received at the curbside. We have great lobby hosts, okay? These are the official people who are part of the volunteer team who do an amazing job. But beyond that, even if we're not part of the service, whether that be here or whether that be in the lobby or curbside, we are to be part of serving the body of Christ. We are to be part of using our gifts to build up the body of Christ. And so we really need to unpack a little bit of what that looks like. And what I want to begin with is looking briefly at verse 25 and 26, where Kirk left off last week. He talks about the unconverted who comes to church and sees the reality of God in verse 25, and it says, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And then Paul proceeds, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one, and then goes on to unpack that. And what I want to remind us of this morning is that our gatherings reflect our hearts. Worship begins on our knees and continues in relationship. And so we can often relegate to this person who was convicted of sin when they came into church. We can say, well, that's kind of a once for all and then I'm good to go. No, what we need to understand is there needs to be a transparency of our heart before the throne of grace when we're alone on our knees before God that happens before we come together as a community of faith. We cannot forget that fact because we are saved by grace through faith. We're not we're free from the penalty of sin, but we're not free from the presence of sin. And so we need to do some business prior to coming to church so that what's reflected in our worship is reflective of the body of Christ and the way he desires it. I'm thinking of the words from the song, you search much deeper within than through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. And so we need to allow the Spirit of God to expose the secrets of our heart so that we're authentic and transparent with people as opposed to keeping up appearances and masks and facades. We need to be, pay attention to the condition of our heart and we also need to be transparent with people. We need to have people who are close to us, who know our struggles, who know our pain, and who hold us to the word of God. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, not so that I can hold it to myself, but so that I could speak a word of truth in grace to my brother or sister. So the importance of attention, the importance of intention. And then foundationally, of course, we see Paul's very explicit. He says the purpose of our gathering is to build up the body of Christ. Let all things be done for the building up of the body. Question is, what does it mean to build up the body of Christ? Well, ultimately, the body of Christ is built up when everything that is done and said is submitted to the authority of the Word of God. You'll notice there in the passage that Paul talks about how prophecies are subject to prophets, how, how the Word of God is being, um, how does he put it? He says it's it's what is said is weighed. In our church, uh, our elders have been given the spiritual authority. 
And what that means on any given Sunday is that when we come together, everything that is said and sung and done needs to be under the submission of the scriptures. And ultimately, the elders are the ones who hold us account to that. So that if I'm preaching anything this morning that is offside scripturally, then I would expect the elders to bring correction. And so, to build up the body of Christ, first and foremost, foundationally, we need to bring everything under the authority of Scripture. And then we need to use our gifts for others' benefits. And here we see the issue of tongues and prophecy. And we saw that some of these gifts were being used in a way that was bringing attention to the person who was giving the tongue or the prophecy, or was distracting from the heart of worship. And Paul's saying, look, when it come together, there needs to be, this is what it needs to look like. And so he's specifically addressing tongues and prophecy, and then he also addresses the issue, which we're not privy to, the issue of there is some disruption caused possibly between a husband and wife, Okay, we can unpack that a little bit in the podcast. What Paul is not saying is he's not saying that, yeah, women, once they come into the door, they should be quiet. He wouldn't say that, obviously, because Paul endorses the prophecies and prayers of women in chapter 11. Paul recognized Priscilla as instrumental in hosting a house church. Uh, Women were crucial to his ministry. And so what Paul is not saying, be clear on this, is he's not trying to suppress women using their gifts. That would be completely contradictory to the whole thrust of his message and ministry. Okay, so what we do need to understand is he's addressing something that was happening in the context of the local meeting that was distracting, and so that's what he addressed. So the Corinthians would have understood that at the time, and we're a little bit puzzled because we're not privy to that. I'll talk about the theories or the perspectives on that in the podcast, uh, but I'm not going to unpack that today because then I'll get caught in the eddy and I won't be able to get out of it. Where was I? Um, Yeah, I was thinking of two, two instances today in my own life. When I lived in Northern California, I was part of this small Baptist church there, and I remember one Sunday, this person approached the pastor and said, I have a word from the Lord. And the pastor, unfortunately, gave this person the mic and they proceeded to criticize the pastor for not bringing us into a deeper sense of the word of God. Guess who got the attention that morning? This person. Was it, was it beneficial to the congregation? No, it was not. Another instance happened a number of years ago here at Forward. There was a drama presentation that was meant to illustrate a principle that was used in the message. Someone decided that they felt led of the Lord to stand up in the middle of the drama and presentation, interrupt it, and say that we needed to stop. Hugely disruptive to the church. This person thought that they were following the Holy Spirit. What they were actually doing is doing the work of the devil because it derailed everything that was done, and all we can remember from that morning is this one person and the disruption that was caused. And that illustrates a little bit of what can happen when we decide to use our gifts in a way that is disruptive and brings attention to ourselves. And that's really what Paul is saying. Look, let's keep the thing the thing here. This is about building up the body of Christ. God is not a... God of confusion. He's a God of peace. And he's also a God of order. So things should be done decently and in order. The goal is for the body of Christ to reflect the beauty of Christ for the glory of God. And what came across clearly in our worship through song is the fact it's all about him. Okay? But the implications of our relationship, they're important because when we come and the symbol of the cross is there, there's both a horizontal and a vertical relationship. So we can't say it's all about you and be at odds with our brother and sister. That's not worship. The cross 
has the vertical, it has the horizontal. It's not a post, it's not a beam, it's the cross. And part of our worship has implications relationally. And if we're living in disobedience, as Greg reminded us in the Freedom Session video, if we're living in disobedience by being at odds with our brother and sister, then we cannot say that I am all about worshiping Jesus because how can we love the Lord who we have not seen when we don't love our brother or sister who we see? Okay, so the, there's profound implications for us as a body of Christ. And what suppresses the spirit of God in the church today more often than not is the discord and disunity within the body of Christ. And so that's why this, this subject of what it means to do things orderly has nothing to do with an order of service that is good for all times and all places because that's simply not the case. Our weekly gatherings should be a living representation of both the order and the wonder of God's creation. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Should be a, a living representation of both the order and the wonder of God's creation. See, order is order when it directs our hearts to worship. Order brings clarity, not confusion. And I think, as was said in the podcast this last week, some of the pagan religions, and of course we see that when Elijah um, and the prophets of Baal are having this competition as to who's the real God, and the, the prophets of Baal work themselves into a friendly, frenzy. It's chaotic, and, and Joshua, I mean, not Joshua, but Elijah, um, everything was done orderly, and God demonstrated his power through that. So it brings clarity, not confusion. Order maintains focus on the central figure, which is Jesus Christ. So true order is going to place our focus on Jesus. And order avoids making the participant the center of attention. You see, we are supposed to use our gifts and talents to bring up, build up the body of Christ, but not to make a name for ourselves, not to impress, not to look impressive, but to redirect our fo focus on others and ultimately to Jesus Christ. You know, order look... What order looks like is conditional based upon cultural norms. And uh, I had the privilege a number of years ago of doing some research in England. And on one of the Sundays there, I visited a small Anglican church in just outside of London. And it was a church that followed the Book of Common Prayer. When there was communion, we went in line and we shared a common cup. And it was done in a traditionally orderly fashion. But my experience with that church is, man, the Spirit of God is here. You could just sense it, you could feel it, yet it was liturgical. It was orderly in more of a traditional sense. And, and I kind of like that man in verse 25 said, wow, God is here, God is among us, and it was wonderful. And then a number of years later, I was able, I had the privilege of going on a missions trip to Cambodia. And we we're in Phnom Penh at the center, and um, I had the privilege of being part of that service. And it was incredibly different. There was all kinds of dancing. There was all kinds of different styles of music. It was things were not done in this sort of regimented British way. But you know what? I sense God is among us. It wasn't disorderly but it was a reflection of the culture. And the Spirit of God was amongst us in Cambodia as much as it was in London, England at the Anglican Church. And the fact of the matter is, is that culture, I mean, yeah, culture will form what we see of as order. And that's why we need to ask ourselves what ultimately is order about. Order directs our hearts to Christ. It brings us back to the cross. The unique challenge of our setting, and I think this is a great thing, is that we're increasingly becoming a diverse cultural tapestry. You know, as, as we see all people from all nations come together, and as I see our church increasingly reflect the tapestry of the culture around us, it's a beautiful thing. But it means a couple of things here. It means that the principles of consideration for others will become increasingly important. 
because we have people who have been at Forward here for over 60 years and have seen many changes. And we have people who have come from Nigeria and Jamaica and different parts of Asia, and their experience of worship and order is different than what they see here. And we have opposite sides of the spectrum and everything in between. And what we have to ask ourselves is, what is God trying to do amongst us? And we need to have greater consideration for others as opposed to trying to push our own idea of what constitutes orderly worship. Because the fact of the matter is, when we get to heaven and we are around the throne of God, singing and praising God, it is going to be people from every tribe and nation, and it is going to be so diverse. It's going to be wonderful. So wouldn't we want our church to reflect that diversity, that tapestry, that beauty, that difference, and yet be united under the cross? I do. That's the kind of church I want to be part of. So every service should be both comprehensible and mysterious. By comprehensible, in other, in other words, we should understand what is being done and said. And that's why Paul is talking about tongues here, and he's saying tongues are legitimate, but unless you have an interpreter, then don't offer them publicly because we want all things to be comprehensible. But we also need to understand that we don't want to put God in a box. And so there's a mystery that's happening as we come together as a community of faith, much of it that we're not privy to. God is working in hearts. He's working miracles amongst us each Sunday. And we may or may not be privy to that. So there's a mystery that's happening because the Holy Spirit of God is indwelling the life of the believer where two or three are gathered, there am I is in your midst, and so he's among us. The angels are here. God is being honored and glorified, and hearts hopefully are being convicted, changed, and transformed. So there's a mystery there that we need to recognize and pray into. Let God be God, let's not put him in a box, but let's also do things in a way that ultimately point to his honor and glory. And verse 31 and 36 remind us that everyone is a participant. The question today is, how am I contributing to the body of Christ? You see, the service is not called that just so that we can be served, but so that we can serve. Okay, again, we're not talking about a volunteer component, although I think we all need to serve in that capacity in some way. But I'm talking about in a relational sense, where we are privy to the people around us. We are rather recognizing those around us. We're prayerful about it, and we're expectant, expecting God to use us in some seemingly big or small way. Have you ever prayed about where God wants you to sit on a Sunday morning? I know some of you, guys, some of you have your, like your initials engraved in your seat. But have you ever thought, hey, what if God wants me to cross paths with someone else and has me sit in a different place? Be prayerful about where you sit. He might have you sit in an area and you touch a life that you wouldn't have otherwise. Have you ever prayed about the conversation that you're going to have in the lobby or the parking lot? You see, if we're prayerful about that, then we are in a posture of serving we're in a posture of being used, and what you say that morning or the prayer that you pray for that person could be a catalyst for that life. That is what it means to contribute and build up the body of Christ in big and seemingly small ways. But there are no small ways because if we're in a posture of being used by God, then let God be God, and he's going to take that seed, and he is going to produce something that will blow our minds. And so that's why I wanted to leave us with four principles to practice. And what I did here is I thought, well, what are kind of the recurring words or themes that, that Paul uses here? Not meant to be prescriptive, but rather meant to bring awareness 
as principles to the way that we can make some adjustments in our perspectives each Sunday as we gather. And more importantly, as you prepare to gather on your knees before each service. And the first one is to wait. In other words, put others before yourself. And again, I'm not meaning to be prescriptive because if, if we just wait and put others before ourselves, then no one will actually leave the building, which could be problematic. But no, are we in a posture of waiting? Are we in a posture of putting others before ourselves or are we really in it for ourselves? Listen. Be attentive to what someone is saying. We have a culture that, by and large, does not teach us how to listen. And when we decide to wait for other people and put others first, then part of that putting others first is to be in a posture of listening and actually caring what the other person is saying and hearing their heart and being ready, if God wills, for us to speak a word of peace. Are we listening? Are we attentive to what people say? say? And actually be silent. Don't draw attention to yourself. You know, be silent in this passage is used in three different instances. And the idea is not that we need to shut up. The idea is that we need to be in a posture where we're not seeking to draw attention to ourselves. And of course, I think we've all been in conversations where we're listening to someone and we're really thinking, how am I going to respond or I wonder if the roast is burning or whatever, you know? So, so being silent is, is not seeking to draw attention to ourselves, but actually putting the other person first, stepping back. And then finally, speaking, but only when we have something that will build someone up. When I was 13 years old, my dad was a pastor in a church just outside of Minneapolis in a small town there. And I remember after a service one Sunday, this woman, middle-aged woman, um, you know, she didn't kind of like, she didn't kind of go down the mainstream. She was, she was um, unique. But she came up to me, but she was also lovely, a uh, godly woman. She came up to me one Sunday and she said, you know, God impressed upon my heart that I need to say something to you today. And she said, Kevin, I, I sense that God is going to use you in the future. And you say, well, she could have said that to anyone. Yeah, true. But she said it to me at an impressionable time of 13 years of age. And I haven't forgotten that. It was a word that was timely spoken to me that a few years later, I remember, and I've held that. And I'm grateful that that woman was not silent in the church. But she used the gift of the spoken word to build me up at an impressionable age, and that has stuck with me. And it's been catalytic. What would happen if something as simple as a word spoken to someone as the Spirit of God prompts were to change the trajectory of someone's life? That's the type of service, heart of worship, that God wants us to reorient ourselves toward so that we're about the other person for the glory of Christ. That's the kind of church that people, regardless of whether they believe our theology, they will see the way that we love one another and they will say, I want to be part of that. I don't understand it all, but I want to be part of that church. It's those seemingly small steps of obedience that God is going to use to transform our church, to transform our city, our province, our nation, and the world. And so toward that end, we want to pursue that with all of our might. Please join me in prayer. Father, we, we thank you that you are here among us. We thank you that your spirit has spoken. But may we not just be hearers of the word, but may we be doers of the word and not deceive ourselves. And so may we, your church, here in Cambridge, 
may we live lives that are pleasing to you, demonstrating, reflecting the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. In Jesus' name.